Imagine living in an old infested home, surrounded by shacks and insulated tents, where buckets serve as bathrooms, a continuous lack of sewer and running water, and not to mention overcrowded homes with a minimum of 90 people living in just one trailer. Can you honestly imagine a place like that? A place consumed with living conditions you would expect to see in a third world country. But for many Aboriginals, it exists right here in Canada. Last December, the United Nations Human Development Index released Canada's rank as the ninth best country to live in out of nearly 200 countries ac across the globe. Are we really one of the finest nations consisting of good health, life expectancy, and access to education? Well, let's take a look at the facts. One out of four Aboriginals live in poverty, a figure that's risen to 62 and 64 percent of First Nation children in Manitoba and Saskatchewan, compared to the 15 and 60 percent of non-Indigenous children. Consider the level of food insecurity. It ranges from 31 to 83 percent, compared to the 3 to 9 percent of non-Aboriginal Canadians. And what about education? Over half of First Nations are under age 25, and 350,000 are under 14. But just half of First Nations youth graduate from high school, compared to over 80 percent of other Canadian children. What's worse is that only 8 percent obtain a university degree. How can we ignore the fact that Aboriginals are neglected, pushed to live on the fringes of society, trapped in broken communities with a poor quality of life? Canada is such a multicultural country. I mean, if you could just look around yourselves, you would probably see people who may speak a different language from you, or it's just someone that's from a completely different culture from you. So let's say one day you end up bumping into someone with native descent. My question for you is, how would you react? What do you think the person is, an alcoholic? What do you think the person is, lazy? What do you think the person lives on reservations? I mean, to be honest, a lot of people will actually believe these stereotypes are actually true. And society is guilty of them of making their lives even more difficult than it should be. The sad reality is that these indigenous people are the ones who get bullied they get physically, mentally abused. They get discriminated simply because of where they come from. Is that fair? Honestly? Following the official closing of residential schools in 1996, 80,000 residential school survivors are alive today, but were left with a new obstacle in front of them. To continue on living with the life they managed to hold on to and the journey for a new home, family, and future. Many survivors went on to a life full of trauma from the devastating aftermath of history. They were left scarred and haunted from years of abuse and rape from the residential schools. For many survivors, the residential school trauma went on not only to affect them, but their children and loved ones. Being away from their parents for long periods of time prevented them to learn valuable parenting skills and what it takes to become loving parents and the difficulty of expressing parental love to their children. Years of abuse and neglect that survivors suffered resurfaced in their own relationships, ending with the abuse becoming the abuser. The consequences of physical, emotional, and sexual abuse produced generations of bolding, broken children and continued to be felt in each generation. As parents struggled with the trauma of their own experiences, they remained powerless to interact, help, and be there for their kids as parents should be. In order to deal with the trauma, some survivors may even look towards substance abuse, gambling, alcohol, and unfortunately even suicide. These things not only have an effect on the individual but the community as well, since elders are looked upon by the young. As a result, Aboriginal communities have high rates of substance abuse, crime, violence, and even suicide. Today, Aboriginal communities and individuals are still in the process of healing. The trauma from the residential schools left on the survivors includes feelings such as shame, self-hatred, racism, isolation, and fear of authority. Not only that, the trauma caused the Aboriginal community the loss of cultural history, traditions, and identity. Understanding the impact the residential schools had is critical to addressing the challenges of the Aboriginal people today and helping their healing process from this unfortunate part of history. It is estimated that over 150,000 Indian, Inuit, and Métis children attended residential schools in Canada during that time. I have also learned that residential schools operated in Canada for about 120 years. During that time, children were taught that being Aboriginal was wrong and that they needed to conform to the normal way of life in Canada. They were told not to speak in their native languages and to only speak English. If one of the workers heard them speaking in their own languages, they were often beat or locked away as punishment. 
The children that attended residential schools were often emotionally, mentally, physically, and sexually abused. Canada is such a diverse country, but I feel like there is still so much that we can do for the Native people who had to live through the horrors of, resi of the residential school system. My topic is about the missing and murdered Indigenous women in Canada. The reason for specifically choosing this topic was because I am a young woman who is concerned about the mistreatment and deaths of these innocent lives. This is issue impacts all women regardless of whether they are First Nation, Métis, Inuit or non-Indigenous. These women are being taken advantage of which oftentimes results in death. This issue needs to be acknowledged, discussed openly and dealt with. These innocent lives are someone's mother, sister, aunt or wife. What is happening to these women is occurring right here on Canadian soil. Canada has all the means to resolve this tragic issue, but has not done so yet. From doing research, I have learned about a group known as Native Women Association of Canada that has created a database of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. Based off of the 582 cases that has been collected from NWAC, 67% are murder cases which could have possibly been from homicide or negligence. 20% are cases about missing and murdered women and girls, and 4% are about sus suspicious deaths. Indigenous women are three times more likely to be murdered by a stranger than a non-Indigenous woman. However, First Nation, Métis, and Inuit women who become involved in prostitution become more vulnerable and usually tend to experience more violence. This issue of prostitution connects to the lack of opportunity faced by a lot of Indigenous women in their home community. Missing. Murdered. These two words strike fear in the hearts of many. To be missing holds a sense of helplessness. But to be murdered holds a sense of hopelessness. You can't do anything. That person's life is gone. These two words separately are horrifying, but together they shake fear that's unimaginable within someone. Sadly, these phrases don't just end with missing and murdered, but there's a third element. An element not of what, when, where, why, or how, but a who. And that who are Aboriginal women and girls, missing and murdered Aboriginal women and girls. I wonder why that just rolls off the tongue. There was something that was very distressing, but interesting. It's that articles about missing and murdered Aboriginal women seem to be distributed constantly. But according to the Native Women's Association of Canada's research from 2000 to 2008, only 3% of Canada's female population identifies as FNMI. But yet 10% of all female homicides are of Native women and girls. Topics such as prostitution, drug use, alcoholism, or domestic violence are some of the main factors that arise. These women and girls have vices that further strengthen the chance of them going missing and murdered. Missing and murdered Aboriginal women and girls need some sort of attention, awareness, and most importantly, action. So Beatrice Colton Mozione is a Canadian Métis author who is mostly remarkable for her first novel called In Search of April Raintree. She is the youngest of four children and grew up living in foster homes. And um, after hearing the shocking news about her two sisters who had committed suicide, she then decided that writing the book would take her mind off of it. Um, this novel was published in the year 1983 and it soon became a Canadian classic. This novel um, is about two Métis sisters named April and Cheryl Raintree. And as little children, they were sent to different foster homes due to their unstable household. Um, the parents' reason as to why they were to be taken away was because they were very sick and they were unable to take care of their own kids but little did the sisters know that the parents were actually very alcoholic. The parents covered up their, their use of alcohol drinks as their medicine to help heal them. April and Cheryl eventually gets um, separated from each other, but they continue to write each other letters and once in a while they would meet. When they were younger, they were treated very differently and they were criticized with their own ident identity. Um, when they finally get moved to their foster homes, um, new experiences arrive along the way for them, at least mostly for Cheryl. Cheryl mostly got welcomed by families that took good care of her and loved her. While on the other hand, April experienced love in one foster home, 
until one unfortunate event when her parent, when her foster parents gets very ill and she's asked to move away to another foster home. Living in the new family, which is now the De Rosiers, has it caused um, a huge impact in April's life. It never, she never gets treated right in the household. She never gets the freedom of speech to stand up for herself. And until one day when she's had enough of all the criticism she's um, received and the pe negative people around her. Her experience in their household had uh, caused her to be a stronger woman for herself and for her little sister Cheryl. And, but at the same time, she was also ashamed of her, uh, her own identity as a Métis. Um, she wishes to be a white person and she wishes to be included in that society. She uses her white, uh, fair skin to convince other people that she is white. And then she fulfills her wish and marries a rich white man and lives with his family. This novel influences a lot of readers to have an open mind about the natives and the negative aspects and the things that they have to go through. And the readers are able to visualize and feel emotions through the use of detailed text. Reading this book has expanded my knowledge about the natives as well. And I discovered how much pain they go through, especially at such a young age. It is upsetting knowing that natives um, still go through these situations till this day, and even some of them would even commit suicide just because they feel worthless to be in this world. This book um, filled me up with so much emotions because it is a um, it is in the char character's perspective, which made it more effective. And the narrator herself is, is April Raintree, so I was able to put myself in her position and feel the way that she felt. And um, as I read. I was able to visualize everything that she had to go through. So personally, this book, I think it was really amazing because I was able to um, understand more of the real, real life situations and I really like it. The United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, also known as UNDRIP, was an instrument adopted by the United Nations on September 13, 2007. The declaration was created to protect the survival, dignity, and well-being of indigenous people to solve global issues. The declaration took 25 years in the making and the idea was originated in 1982 when the Economic and Social Council, ECOSOC, built the Working Group on Indigenous Populations because of the discrimination that indigenous people face. Most people find it very hard to reconcile the fact that human rights do extend to indigenous people due to the historical legacy of racism, oppression, and colonization. When the, UN, when the UN decided to adopt the declaration, many world leaders expressed their pleasure in adoption. According to Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, it was a historical moment when the UN member states and the indigenous people have reconciled their painful histories and resolved to move forward together on the oath of human rights, justice, and development for all. Indigenous people all over the world have been fighting for a very long time to be recognized as distinct people and the right to run their own lives and determine their own future. This is where UNDRIP comes in and recognizes the rights Indigenous people would like to have. UNDRIP consists of seven things, and they are 1. Language, cultural, and spiritual identity. 2. Life and security. 3. Foundational rights. 4. Education, information, and employment. 5. Participation, development, economics, and social rights. 6. Rights to the country and to our knowledge. And 7. Self-governance. The following rights that Indigenous people seek. Indigenous people want to be recognized for who they are. This means that they want their language, cultural, and spiritual identity to be acknowledged and recognized. They would like to enjoy and pass on to their children their histories, languages, cultural traditions, spiritual practices, and everything that makes them who they are. Secondly, Indigenous people want self-determination. Self-determination relates a lot to autonomy. Indigenous people want to be able to participate in the development, economics, and social rights inside the country in which they were the original inhabitants of. Third, Indigenous people want to be able to live their lives just like any other human being on this planet. This means being able to enjoy the same rights as everybody else without any kind of discrimination. They would like to be treated as equals and to be granted the right to enjoy having the freedom of expression and religion. Furthermore, they should have the same opportunities when it comes to education, health, work, and other basic needs. Until people make real decisions about things that affect their lives, it's very difficult to make progress. Most indigenous communities have yet to be able to achieve this idea. Fourth, they want to have the rights to the land and territories that were forcefully taken away from them. 
Indigenous people are the original inhabitants of that land. Through the hard work of many indigenous people, the declaration was made into a reality. And I have learned that we have to care enough to reimagine and remake our world into an extraordinary nation. To make a better society, we must put creativity over impossibility, kindness over hate, solidarity over individualism, and love over everything else. In the lessons I've learned through UNDRIP, I believe that we finally have the opportunity to make things right between our relationship with indigenous people all around the world. This is an invitation offered by the Declaration itself, and it promises to bind indigenous and non-indigenous people together.